On The Breakfast, we take a look at Nigeria's security challenges with terrorism, a weak police force and the government still planning to end insurgency before 2023. Also, as South Africa and her world says final goodbyes to anti apartheid hero Desmond Tutu, we would be speaking with those on ground. And don't forget, we also would be looking through today's newspapers and analyzing the biggest stories of the day. Good morning, thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. And I am Messi Vopo, it's good to have you join us this morning. That's uh, about 48 hours until the new year. Today is the uh, 29th, 30th? No, today is 30th. Okay, oh, 24 <laughs> hours until the new year. And so, of course, it's a countdown mentally until we see 2022. Glad that you have stayed with us all through uh, this uh, year, 2021. Um, of course, uh, we always kick off the conversations with our top trending stories. And this morning, we're starting with not very, very happy news. And that's mostly because there are still more cases of thieves and robbers and whatever other name similar to that uh, dressed in police uniforms moving across Nigeria. Uh, of course, uh, with two major stories that you know came out in the last 48 hours, one of them in Abuja, where a young man, of course, complained on social media that his, uh, his brother, of course, uh, himself, uh, were both seemingly abducted by men of the Nigerian police force, uh, taken to a far away location on the outskirts of Abuja and forced to transfer 500,000 naira from his account into a, a police uh, officer's account. And, uh, of course, he shared a very, very, very scary story of his experience and how he was accused of being a, an internet fraudster, accused of being a terrorist and whatnot, and was forced to transfer 500,000 naira um, into their account. Of course, he was also accused of being an IPOB member or an ESN member. Um, and of course, you know, that was not even shocking enough. In Inugu State, a video also was posted by a young man who was being taken in a police vehicle to uh, a POS or an ATM machine to withdraw funds for the police officers. And in that video, you can hear them asking if the funds have been transferred and if, you know, the, the payment has been made, um, you know, and also threatening uh, the young man. And so th these are, I hope that we can also quickly share that uh, video clip with you. Very embarrassing, you know, seeing that these are men of the Nigerian police force in different states in the country. Um, and so this simply, you know, tells us, you know, that a lot has, actually nothing has changed with regards uh, police reforms and, you know, fixing the, the cancer that is called the Nigerian police force. And ironically, um, it's just really sad that you find out that the slogan for the Nigerian police is, uh, police is your friend. Uh, which is not the case because if someone is your friend, I'm sure they don't treat you. Not sure. They never treat you that way. They never be hostile to you. They never, even if you have some kind of dispute, I'm sure there's always a way to resolve all of the conflict. But whoever says they are your friend, so it's just, um, it's just you know, walls apart. I mean, it's just really, really funny that you have to have that as you know a slogan. And then the attitude, there's no match with it. But you know, the issue of extortion continues every day and every other time. And it's really, really worrisome and very sad. And so the extortion, um, the harassment, um, you know, in most cases, you know, people are being killed and shot, just killed for no reason. Now, um, it, it just worries me in a sense that, I mean, I think recently you had the DS, DCP, uh, that's the Deputy Police Commissioner, Basia were who actually said that uh, Nigerians should not urge Nigerians not to allow police officers who are not uh, I mean who don't have warrant to go ahead to search them you know with phones and all of that despite the fact that yes it's okay to search on the grounds that there's suspicion and arrest and detain and even shoot but in most cases I mean you also want to look at you know the Nigerian um, criminal code or criminal law that does not that says that you know killing when you kill someone I mean, when you shoot someone for no reason, without, you know, an order, it's a mother. So, but um, I'm just really worried and I'm asking myself, what is the police service commission doing? Because that's, you know, part of the police body that's responsible for, you know, issuing disciplinary actions. And uh, when you talk about discipline, because every institution and everybody should have some, organize, some you know, form of uh, correcting itself of all of the ills and all of that. So oh. uh, in all of this, I, I'm, I'm still asking what the Police Service Commission 
has been doing with the brutality of um, Nigerians across board. And these things are not, um, you know, these things are not in the secret. These things are in the open in the sense that you constantly see people take up to, you know, social media. Thank God for uh, technology and thank God for smartphones and, you know, thank God to... The answer to, you know, your question is um, absolutely nothing in big, bold capital letters. You know, because if you had a police service commission, if you had a police force that was uh, mission out disciplinary measures against errant police officers, they, the rest of them will actually, you know, uh, sit up and behave better. Um, and it also, for these things that we're showing, um, you know, talking about this moment, also tell me that absolutely nothing, once again, in big, bold capital letters, has changed with regards to police reforms and, you know, having a better Nigerian police force. No matter how many times you change the Inspector General of Police, no matter how many times they give out new orders uh, to, the, uh, to men of the force, no matter how many times the President also gives new orders, absolutely nothing has changed. And I've said it before and I said it yesterday again. The Nigerian police force is a cancer, and it's a, one of the things that I would declare as a cancer in the Nigerian, you know, system itself that needs to be completely cut off. It's not you cannot reform a system like this. You so well, let, let's let's take a look like at this. that. You know, let's take a look at that video, and uh, I'm sure that we're able to, you know, even get the audio because there's some sound to it. Take a look at what happened. I'm not telling you. Go straight. I mean, go withdraw this money. Leave this man. I mean, make you go. No, no, they're wasting time. Go. You don't send them? I don't send them. They go pure as now, I won't go down. Oh, you say you don't send them, they go pure as which one you did? You know, they feel like they're bleached by an angle on the pure as they're going to send them. You say, hey, don't send them. If you don't send them, go stay for this place. Because if this man comes, they go put you there. Oh. They go back. Well, these are policemen that are paid, you know, with Nigerian taxpayers' money. They, of course, you know, wear that uniform every day to protect and to serve. But, you know, they eventually turn out to be the thing that, you know, Nigerians need to be protected from. Um, I understand that, you know, the special anti-robbery squad has, you know, been suspended and is currently, you know, non-existent. But the brutality and the extortion and the corruption still exists and is still there. Um, deep into the soul of the Nigerian police force. And DCP, ASP, KKP, IPP, you know, whatever positions that they, they hold, IG, AIG, they cannot tell Nigerians that they're not aware of how bad this is and the fact that it is happening. No, nobody is going to buy that uh, because they are, you know, and I will say they are very much aware that this is, uh, these are the things that their men are doing. The man who lost 500,000 naira to the police, hopefully he gets his money back. But if there's you no You think he gets his money measures, back? How, do, how does he? I don't know. Because, you know, in all of the explanation, I, I follow um, Solomon Bucci, uh, you know, a lot because he's very vocal. Uh, the point is, and really sad him because when I was reading that particular story, he talked about the fact that he had uh, 617,000 naira. So, uh, 517,000. Well, ho ho hopefully, hopefully. But well, how would he money get? Money. How would he get the monies back? Because I, first of all, no uh, he wasn't able to capture, you know, names, uh, tags, and what have you. Well, so, if transfers were done, then you know those bank accounts can be traced. Um, it wasn't cash, you know. So if it was a transfer, then those bank, bank accounts can be traced. So hopefully, once again, he gets his money, you know, his money back. I'm expecting that police will come out and say those are not men of the police force. They are armed men with guns and whatnot, um, as a you know defense, you know, for you know these men. But once again, because we need to go. Once again, um, the Nigerian police force itself. Um, in, in its entirety, except for men like, and sadly, we have men like Tunji Disu, you know, who have been exceptional with their work in Nigerian in uh, policing. Among um, others, yeah, among the, others, you know. But I can't, I can't name five, <laughs> you know. But um, you know, because we have men like that, I wouldn't push him, you know, in the, into that crowd. But uh, sadly, the whole of the Nigerian police force is, for me, a complete cancer, um, and we cannot simply reform the. the yeah, but when you say it's a complete words, cancer, you know, you know how it can be. Uh, with cancer uh, it's usually yes. not uh, uh, the remedy is always almost difficult and in, in most cases you find out that you know those persons actually lost their life well um an investigative committee has been set up you know just like others uh, have been set up in the past but um, no committee will be able to fix what is going on in the Nigerian police force. No matter how many committees you set up, nine of them weekly, um, and subcommittees and you know other committees to investigate the committees um, and to interrogate. And the fact that there's going to be an upward review because you know with that the president is expecting that it would also translate in uh, the discharge of duties and maybe behavior as well. Well. 
we need to move something else. Um, it's a really, really, you know, sad way to start the, you know, the program this morning. But you know, I'm hoping that there's other good stories, and that's what comes up next. Two Nigerian profos uh, professors in the University of Ilorin, which is our next top trending story, have of course uh, uh, been uh, nominated as uh, some of the best scientists in the world. They were nominated among 180,000 others, amongst you know, millions of scientists that were, you know, looked through by a group called the LCVA BV. They are um, an academic publishing company at Stanford University in the University um, in the United States of America. I almost say University of America. <laughs> in the United States of America. They are uh, Professor Kayode Oyewumi and Musa Yakubu, both of the University of Ilorin. So it's congratulations to them. It is good news, I believe, for Nigeria's education sector and for these two phenomenal you know, individuals. Um, you know, and really does still, you know, remind us that there's a lot of brilliance and there's a lot of value that, uh, you know, persons, you know, in the system have. You know, the system itself may not be its best, but, you know, it doesn't take away the fact that there's still some, you know, and a lot of brilliance amongst, um, you know, uh, p people in healthcare, in tech, in, in education, in every sector in, in, in Nigeria. And so we're celebrating this morning, Kayode or Yewumi, uh, Professor, and uh, also Professor Musa Yakubu, both of the University of Ilorin. Mm. Not surprising for me at all. Uh, like I always say that we have lots of talented people. Nigerians are awesome. I mean, I just hope and wish that we had a system that worked, that supports, uh, you know, the people. Then we'd definitely be conquering the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can also see it with the amount of, uh, when we talk about brain drain, when the, com the country complains about brain drain and the amount of doctors and nurses and professionals that are leaving Nigeria in droves, you know, these persons, you know, would legitimately be able to contribute, you know, and you know so the, much. And you know, the thing that the really country. worries me is the fact that we don't even pay attention to, you know, to manpower and, you know, the development of manpower in our society, because it's very key. As much as we would talk about yesterday when we talked about the health sector, we say, uh, if you don't have a you know, population that's very healthy, then you're, you're likely to have a population that is not very productive. And so you also want to begin to ask yourself at this point in time, uh, the number of persons that we see. Nigerians are awesome people. I mean, everywhere we show up. That's why I feel like, you know, a lot of people who get to leave the shores of this country will excel in different yeah. spheres, including uh, academics. I mean, several professors. I would, you know, really mention a lot of them, you know, way back in my university. And like we always say, we, we wish and we hope that we had a system that would also support this an enabling environment because all of these persons would not leave. But the fact that we don't pay attention to the manpower, because it's the manpower, pro productivity and creativity is reducing by the day. Oh, and so mean? that's not even a concern. And even the fact that you even, because at the end of the day, you find that some of the developed countries invest a lot in human capital development because they understand that these persons contribute to the productivity. So for all the things that get to happen, you know, in different parts of the world, it, the spirits don't make them happen. They're human beings. Yeah, and so know, if we constantly you know. invest in their development and, you know, encouraging all of that, human capital de development has never been a thing for us. I, I don't see us as paying attention because for every, all of this, I mean, let's even link it back to uh, the fact that you have, a, a, you know, police brutality and extortion. Then you have a lot of Nigerians. When you see all of that, they say, I hate this country. I don't want to be here. Oh, this country, you know, it's just a dream killer. It kills everything. It kills everyone. And then they want to move away. Yeah. So, so just make um, the environment conducive, provide the necessary, you know, basic infrastructure. Nobody's asking you to give them money. For real. I don't even think Nigerians are isn't saying give, give us handouts. Don't give us 5,000. Just make everything okay. Let's have a police force that's friendly, that treats people with respect and, you know, understanding that these persons are humans in the course of discharging their duty. So it, it, it's quite worrisome. The environment is very toxic. And that's why you constantly have all of that movement. Well, once again, you know, um, you know, there is a lot of brilliance. There's a lot of, you know, um, exceptionalism, you know, amongst Nigerian professionals. Um, and like Mercia said, you know, Nigeria's, uh, Nigerians just need a more conducive environment to excel. And that's the reason a lot of them are leaving Nigeria in droves to find that environment that they can excel, um, you know, and be the complete best, you know, and reach the complete, you know, uh, uh, peak of their abilities. Um, but once again, you know, we'll say congratulations to these two persons who've been able to excel, even in the conditions that they found themselves, um, you know, here in, in Nigeria. Professor, once again, Kayode Oyewumi and Professor Musa Yakubu, both of the University of Ilorin.
To our next top trending story, a writer uh, shared her journey, her marital journey, and just a you know little bit of it, but not a very very happy story. She of course uh, talked about a, a medical condition that she has been dealing with called vaginismus. It's a medical condition where the vaginal muscles clench tightly, um, and you know have a severe or com complete fear of uh, some or all sorts of penetration. Um, and it was, you know, a very interesting read, you know, starting from where she shared that uh, she and her partner before they got married had, you know, been abstinent from sexual activity for almost three years before they eventually got married. And then after getting married, she discovered that she had, um, right from her wedding night when the, it was time to consummate the wedding, um, she realized that, you know, she had vaginismus. Um, and, you know, they continued to struggle with it, went to one gynecologist uh, after the other and, you know, still couldn't find an answer. She even underwent, um, had to undergo surgery and still couldn't find, you know, answers to it. She ended the story by saying that uh, her, herself and her husband have figured out that there is many other ways to enjoy sex in marriage that don't necessarily include penetration. But I'll also quickly point out that, why are your eyes swelling? <laughs> <laughs> I would also quickly point out, you know, that one of the things that she mentioned was, you know, that the only time that she may have, you know, you know, experienced penetration was when she was sexually abused as a child. And so that may also be one of the reasons that she developed uh, vaginismus and, you know, that trauma of uh, penetration. She shared it, you know, as a way to educate and to inform other women who, you know, might be getting married or, you know, dealing with a similar situation to encourage them, basically, which, you know, I found very interesting. Even if I also felt like it was too much information to put on social media. No, you, you know, one of the things she actually said was the fact that, I mean, there's no need to be ashamed of what she's not ashamed of. And so let's just not allow her. Don't try to be ashamed of, uh, you know, ashamed of the situation on her behalf because she's shameless already. And I mean, this is some of the words she actually put out. But, you know, in a society as as and a society where, like I always say, we're very big on religion and you know what that means the fact that abstinence and those who believe in the Bible would say that you need to abstain from, you know, sexual activities until you get married. And to some people, it might sound very exciting. I mean, for me, it was, it was really, really, um, it was really, really shocking, uh, quite shocking that, you know, this could actually be a case. But one of the things that I love about her story and her stuff is the fact that you know, she was able to seek, you know, some medical consent, thinking that there might really be something really wrong with her. And uh, so it, it brings us to a point where you want to say there's a contradiction between science and, you know, religion at this point in time. But uh, very, very well, sad because she sounded like someone who was going through a lot of pains. I mean, the fact that uh, she anticipated that after the wedding, there's going to be just a beautiful time having, you know, a great time and every other. But also making reference to her experience. And it brings us back to the fact that just um, within some days back, we talked about people don't move away from, I mean, there's some experiences, some encounters yeah. people have, and they don't just move away. Yeah. So there's, yes, there's trauma that could leave trauma. You with you for a lifetime. And, yeah. and, and so we cannot, you know, always say, you know, because in, in, in the society as this, uh, we constantly we want to pr protect some of these persons who perpetrate all of this act, because most, in most cases, they are our brothers. They are our fathers, they are our uncles, they are our friends. And so, you know, for the fact that, oh, we don't want to stigmatize, and then we begin to say that the other person involved is probably going through some spiritual issues. So people don't move away. I'm hoping that we, we, we get to a point where we have some form of um, maybe counseling, uh, some form of uh, therapy that would help people and that we encourage people to speak up and speak out against some of these issues so that they can be free. Well, you know, um, she, she didn't necessarily say that that was exactly the reason. Maybe, and I tried, to do, maybe. I tried to do a little bit of um, reading yesterday to know what might, you know, cause uh, vaginismus, you know, and so, um, yes, it's possible that that's what it is. You it's know, possible. And, and, you know, and that's, I mean, that's I mean, why I mentioned it. You know, and I ensure that I spoke about that part, you know, to, you know, point out that, you know, like you said, there's trauma from sexual abuse, you know, um, that, you know, people suffer that may never go away. They might look healthy and look happy and look like they're thriving, but there is certain, you know, types of trauma that just would never go away. And this just might be a perfect example, you know, of a, a situation like that. And so... Um, there, there shouldn't be, you know, any leniency with people who sexually abuse others. I, I don't, I don't. I mean, what, what, what if she's very resentful? I mean, what, what if she's very resentful when her husband, 
you know, it's about to, it's I mean, you're about to engage. And then she constantly, and then she constantly, people. you know, have to remember um, what happened to her when she was much younger. And that makes her, Well, I don't want, you know, I don't want to assume. I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that is. these are just, I mean, there's um, a possibility. I don't that want to assume what her situation is, you know, but, you know, the, the key points are that she shared her story. Um, she mentioned, you know, sexual abuse as a child, and this is what she's currently dealing with. And she ended by saying that there's other ways that, you know, um, uh, people, uh, married people can enjoy um, sexual satisfaction that don't necessarily include uh, penetration. Um, you know, and then, you know, my, it, it was just my own personal opinion saying that I felt like there's a lot, some type of information that really do, doesn't need to be out there. It's good to educate, it's good to inform people and, and you know, to help people who might be suffering, you know, but... Um, maybe because I'm a really private person, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to imagine, you know, in this, being in a situation like that and then sharing with the world that this is what you and your, you know, me and my spouse are dealing with, um, you know, that nobody asks for information. No, 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 you, you, you know, you, I, I think that with the social media now, a lot of people really do not understand how far, you know, stuff can actually travel. Right. So some people just feel feel like, I mean, you're on Facebook, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram. It's okay to just put up the, put up that uh, post, and then they just feel like it's just limited to those in their circle, immediate circle. Not understanding that, I mean, you have a lot of blogs, you have a lot of people who are monitoring, and it can go. I remember a time I made a tweet, and someone called me and said, "Hey, you're you're one of the blogs." And one of the things I asked first was, "What did I do? What exactly, yeah. you know, is the context or you know the content of uh, the report that was put out?" So some people would just probably feel like it's just within my space, but it goes it's, beyond it's, it's your not, space. It's not, it's not even possible. Once mm -hmm. you put it out there, it goes, you know, everywhere. And um, once again, it's not shaming her for wanting to be bold enough to share information like that. That's fine. Um, but, you know, f you know I, ju I just read it and said to myself, I mean, there's other ways that you can share a story like that. You can say it's a colleague, you can say it's a friend, you can say it's anything. But nobody needs to look at you every other well, morning. Some, some of us will figure it out. When it goes to work on Monday morning, <laughs> or look at you when you're at work and, oh, and know that, oh. I mean, there's some information. No, 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 no I totally understand. But, you know, you, you, you can't. You. People can all be the same. And that's the beauty of life. You know, the, well, the fact that uh, people actually are different. And some people are just there and they feel like, let's let it out. Let's just let it out. And in some of the things that she said, she talked about not being ashamed of seeing what she is and she's saying hey don't when don't you say, also when you be say shameful. I'm not ashamed it means that someone had tried to shame you about it before and no, she's, she's, she's but, saying that don't, don't try no 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 that's not the case because she actually perceived that that would always be you know the argument i mean some people come up and say why you, why you put up all of this information why don't you put out all of this information just like you're saying but she's saying hey osarge don't be ashamed on my behalf i'm, I'm already ashamed. shameless <laughs> I'm not ashamed. Uh, listen, that's I'm, not why, saying, that's why I I'm said, not saying you're ashamed. If the, idea, if the mm -hmm. idea was helping other people, then you can do it, you know. But, but, but don't you think that this is a lot of revelation? Because I think that... It's some, too much. No, no, no. It's, it, it, it's okay. But maybe someone somewhere, you know, sometime, I remember someone telling me that some people go through, this is not in the books. So I'm not sure. There's a, I don't know about any theory that actually, you know, holds this. But you know how we can just say that? Don't you think that sometimes you go through stuff so that others could actually learn a lesson from you? So it's more like yes, you're, but you put nobody needs to know and have a picture of what you and your partner are like in the bedroom. That, that's really what I'm saying. So once again, you can share the story it, and it, say, just, it, listen, <laughs> you can share the story and say that a colleague of yours shared her story but with you. But that would you. be a lie. Yes. And that's fine. A colleague of yours shared a story, and this is what she's <laughs> dealing with, and this is the moral of story. The key points for me are sexual abuse and the effects that it could have, you know, much, much later in life. And the fact that, yes, you know, letting people know, and couples, even if a lot of couples would say, no. You know, to the fact that you can have, you know, sexual satisfaction with your spouse for a lifetime without actual penetration. I'm hoping that there is, because, you know, probably we need to also read more. She's been to a couple of gynecologists. Maybe there, you know, needs to be questions as, as to what exactly could be treatment for vaginismus. Um, and if couples who might be dealing with a situation like that can actually get help um, as time passes. So those are some of the things that people need to also question. No, no, so some people just have to go ahead of us and make that mistake and have that experience so that the rest of the world can actually mistake. learn. I, I don't think it's no, a mistake. No, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I mean, it's like... Some people will probably make some mistakes. I mean, it's like looking at yourself. I'm trying to say that sometimes some experience, will, some people would have to go through some experience and share it so that some people can learn from it. So you know that cliche or that phrase that they constantly say, uh, you know, experience is the best teacher. Not necessarily anymore. Leveraging on other people's experience is just the best teacher. Like days. not abstaining until you get one. <laughs>
like <laughs> engaging in sex. That's what she said. She talked about that and also finding other ways of, you know, engaging. Anyways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, best of luck to her and uh, her husband. And, of course, we wish them luck, um, you know, um, with, you know, the future of their marriage. Looking forward to hearing, I'm well, looking forward to hearing more stories, you know. From They'll probably have these very coping. soon. You, you never can tell. Um, our final top trending story this morning is in sports. You know, it's, um, you know, good news, I guess. Um, a new manager has been appointed for the Super Eagles. His name, Jose Peserio, is a former manager of Porto Football Club. And um, he has, of course, been appointed as a new Super Eagles coach. Well, it's got to be here to talk about more of this, you know, I believe today. And, of course, we'll have an extended discussion about this on Friday. Uh, but, of course, um, there's still some criticism. I remember that we spoke about the, the reason why we still continue to hire foreign coaches when we have a lot of talent here in Nigeria. And there is that. And also, there's people who have also criticized uh, Jose Peserio, mostly because he doesn't necessarily have a record that makes him look like the very best option. He hasn't, you know, coached anywhere that was extremely successful. He hasn't broken any records anywhere. Mm. He also hasn't lasted more than a year or two years in every single I mean, I, I mean, I mean, the, the last you actually want to check is the fact that, you know, four months into coaching a club, he's been out. Uh, some people have tagged him as the most sucked, you know, coach. And some people would say that's not a popular name, like you have said. I mean, in, in the world of coaching. So, I mean, it, neither was going to roll, but. No, no, but, but it feels like we always. I mean, let, let's say this, because recently I've been very paranoid with the fact that uh, we're too. We're just. Um, we have looked at ourselves less, and uh, we have acted, you know, because we have looked at ourselves less, we've constantly acted in that way, the things that we get to do. Right. So even if you were going, first of all, we have a problem with the fact that we have a lot of talented, I mean, awesome, uh, experienced persons in Nigeria that we probably used to, you know, coach the people. Like uh, Wallace Scott will always say, I mean, an average Nigerian can actually coach the super ego because we understand, we, we see the people, we understand the talent, and then you, you know what it is. And so it, it probably should have been an advantage when you have a foreign, you know, coach come through, uh, I'm saying it possibly would be, but for what reason would it be? The fact that, um, you know, we have access to what X, Y, Z, all of your experiences and all of that, but that's not the case. So it brings me back to the fact that we constantly have treated ourselves as a dumping ground for whatever is not very good. So uh, um, you, we, 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 why, why do we have to source, you know, for coaches like that, uh, uh, Venezuela? I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, he's not had his time. But let's look at that. First of all, we want to look at the age, uh, 1960. Moral, uh, of the, moral of the story for me is that there have to be questions asked as to why Nigeria always looks to foreign coaches for the job. W uh, which is why? Remember that we've done Stephen Keshi, we've done, you know, uh, Siasi at some point, I believe. Okay, that was for a different team. Uh, but why do we always look out to foreign coaches for the job? And even when we do, what, what is the criteria with which we choose these coaches? Um, do we actually look at their records? Do we look at, you know, what they've done in the past and the qualities that they have? Uh, because once again, for this particular person, Jose Peserio, there's really nothing that you can look to or hold on to and say, you know, this is such a fantastic coach and it will go very, very far with the Super Eagles. So there's, there's, there's something that we may not be aware of that makes them continue to look out for these persons. No, there's something um, that we're aware of and the, something that we're aware of is the way we constantly perceive ourselves. We have looked at ourselves as a dumping ground and that's why constantly you find out that, uh, you know, goods that are substandard are usually dumped here in Africa, in Nigeria, and then we constantly want to, you know, so, so I'm not trying to say he is not up to, but I mean, if you look at the qualification, we have talented persons, we have great players. Why do you have to go, if you want to, let's even assume that, let's even agree with the fact that it's okay to get a foreign coach, because we're still arguing with the fact that why don't you use, you know, the experienced persons that we have, yeah. and now you have to go out, you're going out, you're not even getting the best of the best. So you're just getting, you know, just some, anybody. Just anybody. Just you go pick someone from Venezuela to come coach the Super Eagles. Let's see what pans out, you know, for us in January. Oh, um, well, well, it's got to definitely uh, share a little bit more uh, with regards to uh, that story. Um, of course, we're going straight into Off the Press, where we have a quick review of the major stories making headlines across the country this morning. And um, we'll get into that right after this uh, short break. Stay with us.